Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. How good are you at listening? Today we live in a culture where everyone, it seems like everyone wants to be heard, but no one really wants to listen. In fact, there's this, this phrase called active listening that teaches people that the art of listening takes engagement, not just engagement of the mind, but even engagement of the entire body to communicate to the speaker that, that you're interested in what they have to share with you. Active listening can benefit all of our relationships in life, whether it's being a student in school, whether it's an employee at work, especially in our marriages. But how good are we at active listening when God speaks? If you were to imagine your relationship with God as this pie chart, how much of a percentage of our relationship with God is me doing the talking, and how much of that relationship is me taking time to listen? Today, the Holy Spirit teaches us about listening to God's word through the prayer of young Samuel, who says, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. The words for meditation today are recorded for us in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. I invite you to stand as we read these verses in Jesus' name. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called to Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. We bow our heads and pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father, make us holy by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You may be seated. The name Samuel means heard of God. If you were to read back in the first two chapters of Samuel, you'll, you'll learn about his mother, Hannah, who prays to God for a child and promises God that if he answers her prayer, she will dedicate that child entirely to the Lord. God heard Hannah's cry for help. He answered her prayer. He gave her a child 
and she kept her word. When Samuel was weaned at the age of four to five years old, she brought Samuel to the temple and gave him over to Eli to serve and minister before God all the days of his life. Samuel lived in the temple complex that would have surrounded the tabernacle at at the time, the, the focal point of Israelite worship. And we can tell that already, as a a small child, he took his job very seriously. He was possibly assigned that night to keep an eye on the lamp of God in the holy place, to make sure that the flame that symbolized the presence of God among his people stayed burning through the dark of night. Furthermore, as Eli's eyesight was diminishing. Samuel was probably there, constantly ready and alert, that should Eli call on him, he would be there at a moment's notice to help him in the night. Of course, Samuel, we see he's so eager and alert, three times he runs to Eli, assuming that it's Eli calling him. Now, before I go on, I just want to pause here and just reflect a little bit. When we hear about Hannah dedicating Samuel to the Lord, that idea of offering a child, a person, as a sacrifice, a dedication to God, seems old and archaic. We don't do that today, do we? But in fact, we do. Every time a child is brought to God in holy baptism, that child is being dedicated over to the Lord, given to God as a living sacrifice. This is why Jesus died on the cross. He he died as the perfect sacrifice in our place so that as believers, as the priesthood of all believers, we might offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. And this service to God begins all the way at a young age, even from the moment a child is baptized. And you think of those little prayers that a child learns to pray, praying with mom and dad before bed. Their, their prayers are precious. They are, they're serving as a priesthood of all believers. Today, as we see Hannah following through in her dedication, is an encouragement for all parents, all godparents, all aunts and uncles and grandparents, that when we see these children brought to the Lord in baptism, that we keep that vow, that this child no longer really, no longer belongs to me, but rather belongs to the Lord, and as such, I will endeavor to raise this child in the faith. And I will make sure that this child knows the word of the Lord, knows God's word. In fact, as we think about that, there's, there's one thing in these verses that usually catches people by surprise. How is it that Samuel is, is living his whole life in church, essentially? He's living in church, and how is it that it says he, he doesn't know the word of the Lord, or the word of the Lord hadn't yet been revealed to him, it says? Well, here it's important to remember that the word of the Lord isn't a thing. It's a person. The word of the Lord is the Old Testament name for Christ, the Son of God. He would later become the word of the Lord made flesh. And so when we see that phrase at the very beginning of the verses, when it says, in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not very many visions. That means that the Son of God had not been revealing himself through visions to many people. And so, when Eli recognizes that this is God coming to Samuel, he encourages him to say, Speak, Lord. That begs the important question, though. How do we know? 
How can we be certain that it is truly God speaking to us? Whether we're reading the Word of God or whether we're listening to a pastor preach the Word of God, how can we be certain that is God speaking? Today, there's many groups of Christians that would believe in something called progressive revelation. And, you know, the, the Bible, God, God spoke in the Bible, and there's like this kernel of truth or this kernel of God's word in the Bible. But they would say God's word changes. And that there's certain people that have the authority to reveal God's new revelation as God's word continues to change. And these people that have this authority will feel the special moving of the spirit in their heart. Or, or maybe an angel will appear to them or a long dead saint will appear to them and give them some message. And that will overrule and change what God's word says. No, we would never say that God isn't able to still reveal himself to people today. Yet we'd also say that everything we need to know has been revealed in the Holy Scripture. God's word doesn't change. In fact, Scripture tells us in Galatians 1, Paul says, if we, and he's talking about the apostles, if we or even an angel of light should appear to you and bring a different gospel, um, in other words, a message that varies at all from the message we presented to you, let them be eternally condemned. God's word does not change. It is the sole authority for our life as Christians. However, when we think about that, though, there's, there's an additional layer of challenge because every false doctrine that has ever come up has come from God's Word. One way or another, someone will point to a Bible passage and say, see, it says here. So when every other church body points to God's Word and says, we're letting God's word speak. How do we know that they're really preaching God's word, that they're really letting God speak? As a pastor, we're trained with four rules when it comes to studying scriptures. And I want to share these rules with you because they're, they're important for our personal study or for critiquing the guy up here. The first rule is to always let Scripture interpret Scripture. So let's say I'm studying and, and there's a Bible passage or a teaching that I can't really understand. What I do is I go through the rest of Scripture and find the other Bible passages that speak to that very same thing. And I bring them together line by, and line them all up. And after studying them all, then I can say that, yes, I know what God word, God's Word says about this. The second rule is that when you do that, you gather these, these Bible passages together that all speak to the same thing. The second rule is that I'm going to make sure that the most clear Bible passage passages interpret the least clear Bible passages. So think about, let's say, end times, for instance. We ought to let Jesus' very clear words in Matthew 24 always interpret and come first before we open Revelation, which has a lot of confusing picture language. God's clear word interprets the less clear, more ambiguous statements. The third rule is that Scripture cannot contradict itself. Scripture is all written by the Holy Spirit. And as one author, it does not contradict itself. And so when I'm studying God's Word, and I think I've, I've found a place where it, 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 it doesn't seem to line up, the problem isn't the Bible. The problem is me. The problem is my sinful human reason 
my limited human mind with a limited capacity to understand the eternal things of God. So if there's something that I don't understand, and I pray about it, and I can't find the answer, then I'll let it remain ununderstood and leave it in God's hands. The fourth and most important rule is that all of Scripture is there from beginning to end. Its central purpose, its most important point, is to point to Jesus as your Savior from sin through the forgiveness of sins. John says, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And teachings, ideas that distort or distract from that central focus of Scripture really don't come from God, but come from the devil, who will often use the Bible and twist the Bible and distort it. God speaks clearly through his word. And so Eli told Samuel that night to say that prayer, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What was the message that was so important for God to share with Samuel that night? Well, the message was about Eli, really. Eli, as a father, had sadly, from a young age, failed to teach his children respect. His sons grew up and disrespected God's house and God's sanctuary. And because of this disrespect and this dishonor, God told Samuel that he was going to put Eli's sons and Eli himself to death in order to teach that God's name is to be feared. God wants to be heard. And these verses about young Samuel are set up in contrast. It's contrasting Eli's wicked adult sons with young Samuel, who is eager to listen to and obey God's word. It's all about listening. And the Christian life, if you think about it, the Christian life is really a never-ending study in perfecting the art of listening to God. Now, there are a lot of challenges there. And though I'm not a parent, I can understand that for parents, it's really a challenge when, when you have young kids in church. From a young age, infants almost will always try to demand 100% of mom and dad's attention all the time. And they get upset when they don't get it. But it's important to teach them from a young and early age that the only one who deserves 100% of mom and dad's attention is God. As kids get older, they learn to test things a little bit more. They know that they can manipulate mom and dad, especially by misbehaving in public. And so for parents... It's very important to set clear expectations and clear boundaries for time at church. And when those lines are crossed to have consequences, and then it's so important to follow through with those consequences. That helps teach children respect from a young age. When it comes to our time together in in worship, it's important that that kids have activities that they can do during the sermon that allow them to both listen to what's being said and might keep them engaged. But then at the same time, things that don't distract other people around. Discipline, however, 
isn't just for children. It's for all of us. I find as an adult, it's maybe even more hard to concentrate. My wife has every right to get angry. If she's trying to talk to me and I'm busy texting or playing on my phone or watching TV, and I'm not giving her the attention she deserves, she has a right to get angry. And I think as adults, oftentimes there's so much going on in our mind, so many worries and stressors in our life. It's so loud in here, it's hard to listen. You see, that's what prayer is for. As Christians, whether it's time before worship, whether it's early that morning or quiet time before the service starts, we, we go to God in prayer. We take those things that are loud and screaming for attention on our mind and we hand them over to God so that I can be still and quiet before the Lord. I can still my mind. This prepares us for meditation. Meditation is the art of concentrated focus. And as God's people in, in the worship service, when we, we have this concentrated focus, but active listening means we engage the whole body. We, we stand, we, we sit, we, we bow our heads, we lift up our hearts, we hold out our hands to receive. We even might make the sign of the cross. All of that is actively engaging our listening skills. As adults, you're also communicating to the young disciples in our worship service what it means to, have, to be still before the Lord and to listen. We're all here for each other. And I want especially parents to know that we understand We're here to encourage you, support you. We don't judge you. We know that discipleship is always a process. And we want you to know we will always support you. We live in a culture that wants to be heard, but no one knows how to listen. If we can't listen to each other as people, how on earth could we ever listen to God? But as Christians, you you are the exception. You demonstrate active listening, not just in your relationships, not just in your vocations, but in worship. Listening before God in true faith, believing his word, confessing that by his word, Christ is among us, saving us, strengthening us, empowering us to hear and obey his word. As Christians, let us ever take that prayer of Samuel to heart. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.